So it's my very great pleasure to move us on to, to the next part of the evening. It's my very great pleasure to introduce our speaker for this evening, Hilary Clydesdale. Hilary is a third year PhD student at the University of Edinburgh and her research is funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. Her thesis titled Secrecy, Surveillance and Counterintelligence in the Prose Fiction of Walter Scott and Robert Louis Stevenson um, explores the relationship between domestic forms of secrecy and the narrative structure of the 19th century novel and traces this connection uh, in the changing landscape of ho a Scottish historicism through the century. Um, Hilary also has a keen interest in Scott's poetry. She's published on The Lady of the Lake and has recently presented her research uh, on stage and operatic uh, adaptations of the poem. And so, Hilary, it's a delight to welcome you here this evening and I'd like to hand over you to you for your talk this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much for that kind introduction and for the invitation to talk to you about Walter Scott and secret history this evening. It's such a pleasure to be able to do so at the Edinburgh Sir Walter Scott Club. In the introductory epistle to the fortunes of Nigel, Captain Clutterbuck finds himself in the presence of his great parent, the author of Waverley. But struck by an intense feeling of what he rather dramatically describes as a holy terror, Clutterbuck is first forced to make his way through the labyrinthine maze of dark corridors and small crypts that comprise the back settlement of a fictional rendering of Constable's publishing house in Edinburgh before he is able to discover and meet the ghost-like author. Filled with dread, Clutterbuck moves from one obscure recess to another. In some, he discovers hordes of old, dusty, and forgotten volumes. And in others, he fears that either some ecstatic bard or a band of critics might be hiding, lurking in a productive darkness where the phantom train of their secret work can be realized. Mm. Driven, however, by some irresistible impulse, Clutterbuck manages to navigate this succession of darksome chambers and finally comes across the spectral figure of the author of Waverley, seated in a vaulted room dedicated to secrecy and silence. The author is found clutching a bundle of blotted and revised proofs, which he has been studiously revising until Clutterbuck's dramatic entrance. Clearly, in the final stages of its preparation for print and publication, the author's history is designed to break through this obscure seal of secrecy and silence. Amid the old, dusty, and obscure recesses of the archival crypts, the author occupies a space of tension, mediating between the lost, forgotten, and abandoned histories contained within the very cleverly described vaulted rooms, and these histories' disclosure to the public. Symbolically abutting the public-facing publishing house, the quasi-mystical and cavernous vaults, both literally and metaphorically, back up the industry and economy of the publishing house. Scott situates these secret repositories as a vital bolster to the burgeoning productivity and demand of the early 19th century literary market. And in doing so, he forges a vital role for the historical novelist in this. The meeting between Clutterbuck and the author of Waverley ends with the author relinquishing his bundle of blood-stained papers to the printers. And in doing so, he offers the historical novel as a vehicle, one that is used for transporting these abandoned, forgotten, and secret histories 
out of obscurity and firmly into the public's eye. In the course of this talk, we're going to tease apart and explore some of the complexities and nuances that Scott forges between the idea of secrecy and the publication of historical narratives. We will begin by looking to the historical origins of the genre of secret history, before moving into an examination of Scott's own secret history of the court of King James I, published in two volumes in 1811. I argue that, as a proponent of secret history, Scott's fascination with the genre informs his approach to composing and constructing his historical novels. Then, having traced Scott's fascination with exploring and troubling the boundaries between private domestic spaces and public history, in both his non-fiction and fiction work, I will conclude by drawing attention to the way that Scott contributes to a distinctly 19th century evolution of secret history, not only as its author, but also as its subject. Let's begin this by drawing on Scott's association of the work of the historical novelist with secrecy and silence as we have seen in the preface to The Fortunes of Nigel. The Greek for secret, aretos, means unspoken or unspeakable. And both the secret and the historical narrative are composed and constructed in direct relation to this realm of silence. However, from this mutual foundation, they move towards contrasting goals where secrecy thrives in a state of silent restriction and pretended non-existence, a narrative history works towards disclosure and preservation. One aims to perpetuate and the other fill silence. It is exactly this fascination with exploring previously unheard of and secret information to the public that Scott shares with the secret historian. Widely credited as the first secret historian, Procopius of Caesarea wrote his Anecdota, which is the Greek for secret history, in 550 AD. The subject of his history was the Byzantine Emperor Justinian and his wife, the Empress Theodora. As well as exposing the secrets and conspiracies behind the political actions of the Emperor and his court, Procopius also directs his attention to his subjects' private life and salacious personal scandals. In his Paramium, Procopius argues that these details must be made accessible to the public, who, without these secrets being divulged, would pass on to future generations an entirely erroneous picture of the period's political history and character. In fact, Procopius lays so much historical value in these domestic private secrets that much of his anecdota was heavily censored and omitted when it was first translated into Latin by the Roman antiquarian Niccolo Alemanni. Procopius had previously written two more traditional historical accounts of the period's politics and wars. However, in his secret history, he suggests that he had always intended to write such a scathing and scandalous expose of the court and marriage of Justinian. But, He'd felt that he could not safely do so whilst those responsible for what happened were still alive. For, he continues, it was impossible either to avoid detection by swarms of spies or, if caught, to escape death in its most agonizing form. 
Procopius inaugurates what was seen in the 17th and 18th centuries as the fundamental role of the genre of secret history, to expose the private life and secret scandals of statesmen and politicians previously passed over in silence and present them to the public, all in the name of safeguarding historical truth and accuracy. Procopius and his anecdota provided the model for future secret historians seeking to emulate both his historical process and his rationale for publishing these pieces of libel and, to use Rebecca Bullard's term, printed gossip. It is only after his work is translated into English in 1674 under the title of Secret History of the Court of the Emperor Justinian that the phrase secret history became a prominent feature of 17th and 18th century works. In 1686, Antoine Varillas published his Secret History of the House of the Medicis, in which he highlights his indebtedness to Procopius, who he calls his guide and inspiration. However, Ferillas also wanted to extend the genre of secret history beyond the methods of his ancient predecessor and begins to consciously think of secret history not as a piece of libel or printed gossip, but as a genre of history in its own right, one that should be guided by a fixed method and philosophy. In order to define the role of the secret historian, he compares the traditional orthodox historian, who he defines as any historian who deals with men in public, and contrasts their role with the secret historian, who only examines them in private. The orthodox historian, he says, thinks he has performed his duty when he draws them such as they were in the army or in the tumult of cities. And the secret historian endeavors by all means to get open the closet door. One sees them in ceremony and the other in conversation. One fixes principally upon their actions and the other would be a witness of their inward life and assist at the most private hours of their leisure. In a word, the one has barely command and authority for its object, and the other makes his main of what occurs in secret and solitude. Bearing in mind this definition, it is perhaps unsurprising that authors of secret histories have often been the target of severe outrage with critics labelling such histories as blatantly indecent, libelous, and even unethical. Given these political and emotional responses to their exposés, it was common practice for secret histories to be published anonymously. By the time Scottish writing, in the early 19th century, the genre of secret history has become a rather old-fashioned means of active political engagement. And instead, writers such as Walter Scott, Isaac de Israeli, Johann Fichte, and Leopold von Ranke are looking to the genre as a means of historical and sociological inquiry, in which they explore and debate the theoretical relationship between private secret affairs and public history. It is precisely with this in mind that Deej really writes his tract, True Sources of Secret History. As a staunch supporter of secret history, Deej really begins his tract by calling for his contemporary historians to take the genre more seriously and to acknowledge its value as what he calls a subterranean spring of new, potentially revolutionary 
historical information. D'Israeli argues that secret history was ignored and marginalized in narrative accounts of national histories. And he therefore asserts that this is a subject which has hitherto been imperfectly comprehended, even by historians themselves, and has too often incurred the satire and even the contempt of those who play about the superficialities of truth and are wanting the industry to view it on more than one side. The Israeli is defending the secret history from the charges it had continued to face since Procopius, and, like Varelas, he wants to strip the genre's association with libel, gossip, and inauthenticity. Until this time, secret histories had been publications that dealt with either contemporary scandals or in recalling those of individuals who had recently deceased and therefore remained both in living memory and in active public and political interest. However, one of the defining features of secret history in the first two decades of the 19th century is that the politics, scandal, and domestic secrets of its subjects are no longer of active political and social interest. They are truly secret histories. At this time, we see a number of editorial projects emerge in which previously unpublished memoirs, tracts, and printed gossip from the 17th and 18th centuries are collated, edited, and published for the first time. In these works, the editor occupies a position of great authority, moderating, qualifying, and interpreting much of the author's gossipy evidence. It is precisely this type of secret history that Scott publishes in 1811. In 1809, Scott's work on the Summers Tracks, a 12-volume historical miscellany, gives him access to a variety of historical tracts. And it is from this research that Scott comes across five memoirs, which together span the reign of King James VI of Scotland and I of England. The fifth and final tract, however, is something of an outlier because it was written under Cromwell in 1644. Scott discovers this tract whilst the first part of his secret history is already at press, but he decides that it is at once a companion and a contrast to the previous four tracts. This unanticipated addition is a tract called the Court and Kitchen of Elizabeth, commonly called Joan Cromwell, and it is written with obvious hatred, not only towards Cromwell, but especially towards his wife. The author tries to blame Cromwell's actions on his wife, her cooking, and her inability, according to the author, to effectively manage their household. Scott introduces this tract by acknowledging that the author's depiction of Cromwell's wife is, to the same, to say the least, unnecessarily scurrilous. Despite the author's unforgiving depiction of Cromwell's wife and his overt threats of physical violence, Scott nevertheless values the hate-filled account for containing some curious anecdotes of Oliver's domestic life and housekeeping. Scott's informal reference to Cromwell by only his Christian name reflects the degree to which secret history seeks to scrutinize the character and private conduct of its rulers. Cromwell's domestic life, his marriage, his eating habits, and even his recurrent issues with kidney stones all become telling sources of historical detail and information. The Israeli and Scott were good acquaintances, 
and they engaged in this early 19th century debate about secret history together. Scott publishes his secret history of the court of King James I in 1811, and this inspires D'Israeli to write his an inquiry into the literary and political character of James I, and publishes it five years after Scott in 1816. And then, in 1822, Scott publishes his historical novel, The Fortunes of Nigel, in which the court and character of King James plays a significant role. Scott's depiction of James I is based on the accounts of Weldon, Osborne, Halen and Peyton, all of which are contained and commented <coughs> on in his secret history, published 11 years earlier. In fact, a number of mottos, libelous songs and descriptions of the king's character and personality included in the novel are taken directly from his secret history. As well as drawing on his own secret history to inform his fictional portrait of the king, Scott also acknowledges his novel's indebtedness to D'Israeli's inquiry into the literary and political character of James I. One of the main reasons that Scott and D'Israeli identify James I as the ideal candidate for their secret histories is because of the need to in the words of Scott, vindicate the character of James from Anthony Weldon, whose scathing account of the king had endured since its first publication in 1617, and had given rise to James I's famous reputation for being the wisest fool in Christendom. Throughout the tracts on James I that Scott collects and edits for his secret history, James's Scottishness is used as the subject of ridicule. For example, Scott uncovers a letter by Anthony Weldon, which, to borrow Scott phrase, had somehow crept to press without the author's knowledge. Weldon's account of Scotland and the Scottish people was so severe, critical, and biased that it led to his immediate dismissal from the King James's inner court. With this piece of information, it is perhaps no wonder that the author goes on to write one of the most scathing and unforgiving accounts of James I. To give you a taste of some of Weldon's unflattering depictions of the Scottish nation in this secret letter, unmeant for public eyes, here are a couple of quotations. Of Scottish women, he claims that their breath commonly stinks of porridge, <laughs> their body of sweat, and their splayed feet never offend in the socks. To be chained in marriage with one of them were to be tied to a dead carcass and cast into a stinking ditch. Formosity and a dainty face are things they dream not of. And Weldon concludes his letter by remarking that the men of old did not more wonder that a great messiah should be born in so poor a town as Bethlehem in Judea than I do wonder that so brave a prince as King James should be born in so stinking a town as Edinburgh in lousy Scotland. <laughs> Scott is fascinated with this ability of the secret history to uncover previously hidden details, like the contents of the letter that led to Weldon's tense and estranged relationship with the king. By giving voice to secret tracts previously passed over in silence, it promotes, according to Scott, a more balanced, truthful and accurate picture of Scottish history. Scott's secret history allows him to deliberately disrupt and challenge traditional or long-held historical narratives and sketches and reputations 
by looking to secret spaces and the dark, silent voids in historical narratives. It is for this reason that secret history is often credited in current scholarship for bringing marginalized voices and sources into the stream of public history and awareness. Scott's fascination with secret history and these historical scandals is one that he shares with his friend, Charles Kirkpatrick Sharp, who in 1817 edits and publishes James Kirkton's The Secret and True History of the Church of Scotland. Scott promises to write a review of Sharp's Secret and True History, but due to ill health, he is unable to fulfill this promise. In his journal, however, Scott does write about Sharp and credits him as a very complete genealogist and has made many detections in books of pedigree, which our nobles would do well to suppress if they had an opportunity. Strange that a man should be curious after scandal of centuries old. Not but Charles loves it fresh, and he tells the anecdote with such gusto that there is no helping sympathizing with him. Although Scott conceives it strange that a man should be curious after scandal of centuries old, he guiltily confesses to sharing in Sharp's curiosity and interest. It is precisely this fascination with historical secrets, rooted to his work in the genre of secret history, that informs Scott's approach to the historical novel. Instead of returning to the fortunes of Nigel, let's turn to another example, and one that doesn't relate to King James I. In the heart of Midlothian, Jeannie Deans finds herself at the centre of two secret histories. During the course of her adventures, Jeannie is introduced to Queen Caroline by the Duke of Argyle in order to plead for her sister's royal pardon. However, the entirety of Jeannie's conversation with Queen Caroline is characterised by Jeannie's unwitting references to the open secrets and scandals of the royal court, particularly regarding the king's affair, all in the presence of both his wife and his rumoured mistress. Although she remains ignorant of her faux pas, both the fictional court and the reader of the history are very much aware of the secret history of King George and Queen Caroline. Whilst this is a particularly entertaining episode in the novel, it is, however, really Scott's use of the porches rides in the heart of Midlothian that provides the most significant secret history for the plot and historical structure of the novel. The real relationship between the infamous Andrew Wilson and George Robertson, both sentenced to death in Edinburgh, is used by Scott as a means of viewing this episode of Scottish history from a different perspective, through the lens of domestic affairs and private scandal, those heralded and cherished by the secret historian. Robertson's escape from justice, his subsequent role in the Porches riots, and his years spent in hiding are all transformed into events which were at least partially triggered and informed by his ill-fated romance with the fictional Effie Deans and her secret pregnancy. Scott invites us to agree with Feek's statement that it <coughs> is entirely thinkable that public history can be clarified out of secret history. Like Jeannie, many of Scott's characters from his historical novels find themselves with unexpected personal access to key historical figures. For example, Charles Edward Stuart, General Colin Campbell, Queen Caroline, the Duke of Argyll, George Harriet, and King James I, to name but a few. But I now want us to look at secret history 
outside of the content of the historical novel and examine it in relation to the wider changes in the early 19th century literary market. For, in 1826, Scott identified a growing interest among the reading public to gather information about the private lives of popular authors and for readers to turn willingly to those volumes which promised to lay bare the motives of the writer's actions and the secret opinions of his heart. For, he continues, we are not satisfied with what we see and hear of the conqueror on the field of battle or the great statesman in the Senate. We desire to have the privilege of the valet de chambre, to follow the politician into his dressing closet and to see the hero in those private relations where he is a hero no longer. It is remarkable how similar this statement is to Varelas and his definition of the secret historian, echoing the same language and their collective focus on private spaces, particularly bedrooms, and what occurs in secret and in solitude. It is in reference to the public's mounting and rather intrusive fascination with his personal life and history that Scott begins his unfinished autobiography correctly anticipating that his life would become the source of public interest and scrutiny after his death, and foreseeing, whilst desperately trying to avoid, his private conduct and relations becoming the subject of unauthorised histories. Scott notes, the present age has discovered a desire, or rather a rage, for literary anecdote and private history that may be well permitted to alarm one who has engaged in a certain degree the attention of the public. This desire or rage for private history is exemplified by James Hogg, who begins his familiar anecdotes of Sir Walter Scott by promising his readers partial but certainly exclusive access to private recesses of Walter Scott's personal life, which, it is claimed, no man can give but myself. He writes, the whole that I presume to do is, after an intimate acquaintance of 30 years, to give a few simple and personal anecdotes which no man can give but myself. It is well known what Sir Walter was in his study but these are to show what he was in the parlour, in his family, and among his acquaintances. Hogg's Familiar Anecdotes was published first in the United States in April 1834, and then, two months later, it was printed for British readers under the different title of The Domestic Manners and Private Life of Sir Walter Scott. Joel Rubinstein has conjectured that this delay in British publication is part of an attempt spearheaded by Scott's son-in-law and official biographer, John Gibson Lockhart, to prevent, or at the very least delay, its publication. <coughs> when this proved impossible, Rubinstein suggests that Lockhart used his literary reputation and connections to minimize the public's awareness of the book's publication, limiting its advertisement and the number of reviews it received in literary magazines and journals. News of Hogg's personal history of his relationship with Scott was certainly ill-received by Scott's family, friends, and literary critics alike. And on the occasions when it was reviewed in periodicals, it was subject to harsh criticism, garnering Hogg the reputation as coarse, egotistical, vain, regardless of obligation, careless of truth, and ready to take advantage of any opportunities injudiciously afforded him to break through the decencies and privacies of life, if by doing so, 
he could furbish up materials for an article. Hogg's depiction of Scott's wife Charlotte in his anecdotes was the source of particular outrage, sparked in the main by Hogg's insinuation that she was the product of an illegitimate relationship, leading one reviewer to label domestic manners and private life as an indecent and impertinent collection of falsehoods worthy only of an eavesdropper at a lady's maid's table. The year before its publication, Lockhart was outraged to receive news of Hogg's literary project. And in a letter addressed to Hogg, dated the 22nd of March, 1833, he expresses his shock and disappointment at the endeavor. Hogg had composed and sent his anecdotes to be printed without Lockhart's knowledge, input, or much to Lockhart's dismay, his censorship. In his letter, Lockhart recalls the moment when he was made aware of Hogg's manuscript and its advanced stage in the publication process by John McCrone. He recalls that, the next time I saw him, he produced in this room a bundle of your manuscript and told me, here were your anecdotes. I confess I was exceedingly hurt and angry for I well knew that although you had always loved and respected Sir W, you could not write so many pages about him without saying things that would give pain to his children. You confess that you have no doubt all that you wrote will be published. I cast my eye hastily over the manuscript, and the first thing I lighted on was your statement about Lady Scott and opium. And then, indeed, I was wroth and abused you heartily and said the next thing would be to get Sir Walter's valet and explain the secret history of his toilette. They seemed to me very unworthy of the subject and of the writer. And they contain, among other things, several gross misstatements as to matter of fact. One of them, what must be a mere dream of yours and which directly impeaches the personal veracity of Sir W. Scott. Although Hogg's familiar anecdotes of Sir Walter Scott has not been labelled in literary studies as a secret history, both its scandalous interest in the private affairs of its subject and its gossipy claim to provide the public with previously unpublished and inaccessible material make such a designation apt and appropriate. Hogg's choice of title draws an explicit connection to the genre, returning the anecdote to its origin in the genre of anecdota. Combining our modern sense of the anecdote as a short, intriguing biographical story and reconciling it to its origin in the historical form of the anecdota. Hogg invites us to trace the evolution of secret history into the 19th century and see that the genre and its fascination with exposing the domestic secrets of its subjects for public enjoyment, scandal and gossip remains active in the 19th century. Whilst news of its initial publication was muted by Scott's literary executors in 1834, the editor of Hogg's Secret History of Scott, reprinted in Edinburgh in 1882, conceived that it had always been exceedingly popular among readers of Scott, and attributes this popularity to Hogg's ability to bring Scott bodily before us with all his peculiarities and throws so much light upon the social and more homely side of the great novelist's character. This sentiment echoes that of the unknown author of Hogg's preface, who praises Hogg's ability to present Scott in his strength and in his weakness, and allow his readers to see him caracoling across the wild heaths of the South Highlands, laughing with glee as he wades up to the otters in his fishing excursion, in his exuberance, 
Then again, we see him in his hours of depression, depicting Scott at home with his friends in states of anger, depression, and even on his deathbed, Hogg certainly fulfills the datum of the secret historian to present his subject in, as Rebecca Bullard puts it, a metaphorical and literal state of undress. Rather ironically, the poor reception of Hogg's domestic manners sparks an even greater demand for more intimate details about Scott's life, leaving Fraser's magazine desperate to find more men who can furnish admirable accounts and supply us with personal particulars of Scott. The reviewer is craving for new information about Scott's personal particulars is intensified by his overwhelming concern for its perishability, asking Scott's acquaintances to securely bank their anecdotes in the public's general stock of knowledge where their future posterity can be safeguarded and guaranteed. On the other hand, Scott's personal letters present a different conundrum. They strike the reviewer as a tantalizingly physical and durable resource, what he considers to be an inexhaustible mine of information and entertainment. Scott's letters are shrouded in excitement and secrecy. They present an enticing source of private intelligence to which public access has been expressly forbidden. It is perhaps no surprise that 60 years after the publication of Hogg's anecdotes, Scott's private letters remain a matter of critical interest and excitement. In 1894, David Douglas published his two-volume collection of familiar letters of Sir Walter Scott, which was selected for publication from the correspondence preserved at Abbotsford and is printed now for the first time. As Douglas states, it was intended that the volume now given to the public should be confined to letters addressed by Sir Walter to members of his own family. But other letters, which passed between him and some of his dearest friends, have been included. The Atlantic Literary Magazine heralds Douglas's publication as the long-awaited fulfilment of public interest in Scott's private life. To complete such a task, Douglas mined a wealth of Scott's familiar correspondence from Abbotsford, both literally and metaphorically, transforming Scott's domestic and private spaces into ones of public value, access and utility. Scott's home had turned into a hybrid space. Alternatively, a domestic family home, jealously guarded by the now famous Abbotsford portcullis and its illustrative motto, Clausus tutos ero, closed in, I am safe. And at the same time, it was seen as an unmined, dry as dust repository of secret histories, waiting for historians to prove Scott's motto incorrect. What is particularly interesting is the reviewer's argument that publishing Scott's private letters is not a matter of gossipy entertainment, but one of historical importance. For, he says, Scott's acquaintance with great people was so extensive that he could hardly write the most familiar letter without unconsciously writing history at the same time. Whilst there is so much more to say and explore in relation to Scott and secret history, we can conclude by observing that, although it is conventional in studies of secret history, to consider the genre to be in dramatic decline by the turn of the century and consigned to a state of redundancy. By looking to early 19th century literature, and in particular to the emergence of Scott's historical novels and his literary celebrity, it is clear that secret history is adapted to suit the needs of the literary market. 
even as it declines as a means of political engagement, it proliferates under Scott as a literary one. Thank you. fascinating talks that you gave such a, a detailed and informed sort of context to, to, to ground our understanding of secret history as a genre. Certainly, I know for myself, not a genre uh, I was familiar with, um, so the secret's out now. Um, <laughs> but actually, actually, you, you jogged my memory with domestic manners that actually I had come across that, but not thought of it in the way that you presented it, and it really sort of changed my thinking about it. So certainly a lot for, for me to go away and think about. But, but right now, I wonder if I can invite any questions um, from the audience. Yes. <laughs> Um, thank you very much, indeed. Absolutely fascinating. As you were describing this genre, I wondered where where you would locate John Aubrey in in that trajectory. Yes, that's very interesting. Um, some context for secret history, and John Aubrey isn't somebody that I'm particularly familiar with. But with secret history and the trajectory that we're seeing, we find that domestic secrets and private life start to emerge a dip with a different sort of significance. So from this scale of active political engagement towards a more historical focus. So with Aubrey, if we have a political sense of that as well, secret history would be placed within a, a discussion of his work, I suppose, as well. But he's not somebody that I'm as familiar with, I'm afraid. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I mean, he, he would be 17th century, right. so much of the 17th century, mm -hmm. and wrote his gossipy lives, which are much franker. Right. Yes, anything that has gossipy lives, we see that this connection between gossip as a conversation, and it doesn't always have this same connection to gossip being uh, an intimate conversation. This is something that I've been exploring with Scott as well. We see various forms of gossip and the court and its political character coinciding with these domestic disagreements and arrangements as well. So gossip is something that we see as well not just as a genre of whether it becomes of historical importance or a sociological one, but also in where these trajectories between court life and home life or private life intersect as well. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much for what was a, an extensive, very, very far uh, wide-reaching and deep a discussion of something that I've never really given two seconds of thought to, or even really thought of as a, as a concept. So thanks for introducing me to that. And um, the, the, a few points that you talked about, uh, it sort of opening things up to the historical novel, and, and, and straight away I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I think it was the comment on, on Hogg's basic secret history of Scott, the, and sort of, you know, going for, I don't know what the exact words were, but essentially turning people into these kind of, almost people, people are becoming people with, with lots of dimensions. And, the, and that really makes me think of Scott's frankly quite average, normal heroes who sort of get swept up in these historical moments. Um, so thanks, that's really, that's really rich, and I'm going to take that home and chew that over. But the one, uh, I suppose if there were a question I had to ask, um, I, the name that came to mind instantly when you said, uh, uh, when you started talking about what a uh, secret history is, and talking about um, uh, Procopius, was uh, not John Aubrey, who I, I don't know either, but I, I happily turned to, it's Lucy Worsley. Uh, and I'm wondering where, I'd, and that, that sort of slightly kind of sort of, sort of naughty approach to looking in the, the closet, closet to do history for the people. Um, yeah, where do you think it is now? Is it, is it something we, is secret history something we can play about with now and say, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I would definitely say so. Something that I'm really interested in is the, the way that secret history starts to inform our approach to journalism and special correspondence as well. 
So secret history seems to become, even now, these moments where it could be a royal court becomes a particular focus of intrigue, but also I think that it becomes so relevant to just a media-heavy world too, where these spaces just become connected, not just in between private and public spaces, but even the sort of globalization as well. So I'd say it's, it's a, a particularly hot topic as well about where these lines should be drawn as well between a public figure and how far access a public should have. And of course, in recent years, we've had a number of associated scandals with that as well about people, journalists, but also just in general, the public wanting to find more information as well. So I think it is something that balances the sort of sociological fascination we have with the secret and knowing things that we're not supposed to, and then also um, a connection to politics as well. Thank you so much for that talk. It was fascinating. I'd like you to think a little bit about where you place um, Scott's journal in your discussions, right? Because he's very aware of, of Byron's materials having disappeared. He's trying to record some things. He knows that they're going to turn into material for Lockhart at least. So he's sort of negotiating this, this public-private very much. And I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yes, that's a great question. His journal is something really that he's writing very much aware that it's not going to be private. He's not anticipating that it's not going to be read. So his journal is one of these fascinating texts because he's very much aware that these public, his public life and his private life are intersecting. But I do think within literary studies at the time, with a growing emphasis on literary biography, these sorts of texts are becoming more and more popular as a way of engaging with literary history as well as with historical figures. And Scott seems particularly aware and quite attuned to tapping in with this fascination that the public's having with him. We know that the great unknown, he enjoys playing on that anonymity, being a figure that is half known, half enshrouded in a secrecy, that he then really toys with and plays in his novels, particularly his prefaces. And maybe it might be quite a radical connection, but we could perhaps start drawing connections between his journal and the preface in some respects, where he's playing around with himself as a historical character, even in that quote we're looking at, he says, if his literary reputation su should survive his temporal existence, and I think he knows quite well that that is going to happen. So he, he, he does deliberately play with himself, the author of Waverley as a fictional character, and this emerging li literary market that is delving into the author as this half-hidden character and person and individual that contributes so much to public enjoyment and entertainment that people want to then peek behind the curtain, so to speak. Yes. Uh, encyclopedic, as far I would call you, what you've given that, that's just now. <laughs> anyway, two wee notes and a wee question. I'm going to keep it short. Um, first of all, there are two industries on the go at the moment, and they are in um, uh, Lockhart's history. I think it's Professor Garside. Here, Peter <laughs> has got something to say about this. I'm very sure because he knows the lock up. It's really, really, really working. It's a secret, it's a secret present. <laughs> uh, it's a secret, yes, absolutely. Yes, right. Um, second of that, um, I have discovered the name of uh, a, a most important book of governance called Basil van Doren. And this is by the very smart cookie who is, in fact, James VI. Uh, and there's a new one coming out, possibly getting through and behind all the bad publicity that sometimes James VI got. Anyway, so you're sparking a whole lot of interacting um, industries on the go at the moment. But um, to my um, enlightenment, please, who is the Disraeli? I'm just thinking of Disraeli, the parliamentarian. Is yes. it, this is another person with yes, the name. Yes, he's related like, is to, he is the, the grandson of the more famous politician. Oh, the grandson of the yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thanks very much. Yeah. Sorry, do you mean his father? Right. Yes. Sorry. No, wait a minute. Yeah, the, the yes, it's one generation. Benjamin. Benjamin. 
yeah, that one's right. right. By the way, do you know about the, the suppression of secret histories, which was attempted because David and I are hot on the Mr. Bad to Know Byron, the um, suppression of Moore's um, uh, stories of, uh, and recollections of Byron. And the Murray family were right up to here and keeping um, uh, lubricious stuff um, out of the public's um, sensitive ears. <laughs> Well, actually, just, just to follow on from the Byron one, and that's a whole separate lecture, but I think in, in, in particular relevance to Scott is his two reviews of Childhood's Pilgrimage, which are semi-autobiographical anyway, where he defends the domestic uh, and private character of Byron, uh, which is very much exposed and, and certainly is a commercial success, and I'm sure Hogg had that in mind when he was writing the Tatumatism of that uh, kind of lucrative market. Um, but I think what Scott writes in the reviews is, is very telling and reflective of his own personal interests and, and, and how he's presented, not just in how, uh, how Byron is as well. So I think they're if not looked at those, they're definitely worth feeding. Yeah. Yes, most definitely. And it, it is wonderful at this time, as you say, this fascination and interest with, with Scandal. We see that even with John Galt and his work of Byron in which he starts by saying he's not going to talk about the scandal and then just a few sentences later proceeds to talk about the scandal. So we do find that this becomes a really helpful mode of engaging with readers as well. It becomes something that does help this literary market too. And something as well to come back to the Basilicon Dorum, which we see uh, in The Fortunes of Nigel. I always find it quite remarkable with the character names, Steenie and baby Charles coming from the secret history as well. And Charles in The Fortunes of Nigel says that he's worried that his father is going to speak from the royal gift of the Basilicon Dorum. So Scott is really playing around with these texts that James wrote himself, text that as well his private letters, which is something that actually promotes him writing The Fortunes of Nigel in 1822. So it seems a really long interest with historical figures as well, and kind of giving them this hybrid space, I think, in this literary world. for answering so generously uh, the questions that we had there. I think there's probably going to be further discussion later on, but maybe for with a glass of something in a short while. So thank you so much for that. So I'd now like to invite uh, Ainsley McIntosh to give the vote. Thank you. Well, Hilary, thank you so much. I'm happy for myself and everybody who's here this evening. That was a truly wonderful and rich and, and just unique paper that you offered us this evening. I mean, not only did you deftly and specifically guide us through the history of secret history, you brought into dialogue works of non-fiction by Scott that we don't talk about very often alongside much loved and instantly recognisable works of fiction. And alongside that, you know, as Mikey said, you, brought, you, you kind of brought this idea of secret history to light. You made us think about it in a new way. Um, and, and as you yourself gestured, um, you made us really think um, in terms of the fact that you know, we, we talk a lot in current debates about you know, what is in the public interest, but these are not debates particularly to our time. They're debates that have run for centuries. So thank you so very much for that wonderful, wonderful paper. And um, you've also made on a different little question the extent to which I reek of sweat and porridge. <laughs> but hopefully, hopefully, um, the ensue, I think we all need to collectively all do the, the ensuing canopies and why we'll hopefully mask that. <laughs> so I'd like to invite us all to join in, in, in extending a very heart, well, uh, heart, heartfelt and warm thanks to you. Thank you.